everyone. Welcome um, everyone to the Bangladesh at 50 Beyond Rhetoric conference. Thanks for taking the time out to be here. It's been great to see that people have responded so enthusiastically to the conference. It's really important that we're here, we're celebrating and reflecting on the achievements of the last 40, 50 years and in particular the challenges that remain. I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Nasreen Kandukar in a moment, just to tell us a bit more about the ideas behind the conference. First, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of Queen Mary University of London. The conference is being hosted by the Queen Mary South Asia Forum, a network of scholars and students researching on South Asia. If you'd like to know more about what they're doing, I'll put a link in the chat. Queen Mary is in the heart of East London, home to UK's largest Bangladeshi population. The community is reflected in our student body, as well as exciting local initiatives like the Brooklyn Circle and Shadinata Trust. Bangladeshis in East London have played an important role in the area's rich history of critical thought and social struggle. And because of all of these things, I'm really pleased that we're able to do this conference here. At the same time, this is a conference for and by scholars in and from Bangladesh to engage in challenging discussions about the country's history, culture, and politics. This conference might not be perfect. There's topics, of course, there's topics we might have missed, and I'd encourage, nonetheless, I'd like to encourage everyone to contribute to the debate that we have today through and over the next two days um, through, your com through your comments and questions. Finally, I'd like to thank a huge thank you to the participants and organizers for their time and commitment at this these tricky and difficult times. This is a really important conversation and I look forward to hearing your views. Thank you. Over to you, Nasreen. Hi, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone, uh, wherever you may be physically based at the moment. I'm Nasrin Khandakar, uh, welcoming you to this conference, uh, Bangladesh at 50 uh, Beyond the Tory. Um, December is a festive month for Bangladesh, and this year we are very happy to be celebrating 50 years of our independence. And today is special as well, it's the Rokia Day, celebrating our long feminist history with her birth and death anniversary. We are really excited to welcome you to the inaugural day of this three-day conference. Um, Throughout the year, there have been a number of discussions, lectures, and conferences about this important juncture for Bangladesh evaluating its overarching achievements and challenges. While that is indeed relevant for this historical moment, we would like to take our discussion forward with specific topics that are crucial for peoples of Bangladesh at the moment to reflect on critically beyond the much celebrated rhetoric of resilience, growth, empowerment, uh, development, or progress. Here, we want to engage with the challenges and hope from the perspectives that are often ignored, from voices that are unheard, or the issues that are often avoided. The idea of the conference came about from our discussions for creating a space for Bangladeshi scholars by keeping in mind our positionality in the hierarchy of global academic sphere. We wanted to challenge the colonialist hegemony to examine Bangladesh as a field to be researched on, ignoring the critical and embodied knowledge that the Bangladeshi scholars have been producing for decades. We therefore wanted to bring the critical scholarships mostly produced by Bangladeshi scholars who are studying and working at universities all over the world to dismantle the so-called global local binary. However, we acknowledge that this conference cannot do justice for all the critical scholarly voices and valuable research that needed to be put forward and engaged with. We are only able to scratch the surface and we acknowledge these absences as our limitation. But this is just a start and we really hope that there will be other initiatives to bring forward the marginalized and ignored scholarships and open up vibrant academic debates about Bangladesh. We also hope that we will be able to organize something on a more regular basis where we can be more inclusive and diverse in the future. We are very excited to have 24 Bangladeshi scholars to present in six panels. 
the panels are categorized only for the organizational purpose. Um, the topics of the panels overlap with each other and do not have any hierarchy between them. We believe that the real strength of any conference is not only the presentations, but the valuable discussions that they, they generate through the participation of the audience. We are really excited that so many of you registered and are here today, not only from Bangladesh, but from many other parts of the world who are, in, who are interested in Bangladesh. We would like to thank you for your support and enthusiasm. We are looking forward to your engagement in this conference. The idea of the conference emerged organically within our collective without any institutional or organizational funding. However, we are so lucky to have Queen Mary University of London to support our ideas and provide institutional and technical support. I want to express our gratitude for that. Before I turn it over to the moderator, I would like to say a few things about housekeeping rules. So please bear with me. We want to make this a, a space for engagement. So we really want to hear from as many of you in the audience as possible. But we will be taking questions at the very end after the presentations are complete. So please post your specific question into the chat function and our moderators will take it up and read out to the presenter. If you would rather ask the question directly, please post the question into the chat function anyway and indicate that you want to ask it directly. In that case, we will call you out and ask you to unmute yourself and ask the question. Without any more delay, I want to hand it over to Dr. Bina De Costa for moderating the panel. Thank you, Bina, for being here with us today. Bina is a professor at the Department of International Relations in the Australian National University and an Australian Research Council Future Fellow. Her publications include seven books and numerous articles, including Nation Building, Gender and War Crimes of South Asia on 1971 and 1947. She's a member of the Chittagong Hill Drug Commission and her current research focuses on Preparation for Biangona and the Children Born of War. Over to you, Bina. Thank you so much, Nasreen. Uh, before we start, I would like to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional land the Australian National University stands and where I work. I pay my respects to the elders of the Nanowal and Nambri people, past and present. Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us today on this very important occasion for this very important conference. Those of us who are participating and listening in, in this first panel and throughout the conference, we all deeply appreciate the intellectual commitment of the organizers of this event. Nasrin Khandokar, Hannah Shams Ahmed, Said Ferdos, and Laili Uddin. Working from different parts of the world, the organizers brought together scholars of and from Bangladesh for critical conversations about history, politics, and culture. I'd also like to express my thanks to the organizing team who have done such incredible work um, for this um, successful conference that we are going to be participating in. I'd now also like to warmly welcome and thank our speakers tonight for our first panel, Nation, Histories and Possibilities. We have three speakers, so I'll introduce them one after another and also mention the title of their paper. Throughout the uh, presentation, if you have any specific question or any comment, feel free to type that on in the chat function. Please make sure that your microphone is muted, but we welcome you to leave your camera on. Our first speaker today is Professor Said Fedos. Said loves to work in the blurred zone of the disciplines of history and anthropology. He has been teaching anthropology at Jahangir University, Bangladesh since 1995. Said has a PhD in history from Lancaster University. Um, based on his research work and his anthologies, he has also a numerous work. He has also recently published Partition as Border Making, East Bengal, East Pakistan, and Bangladesh. Said's presentation today is titled Reading Between the Lines, History and Nation in Bangladesh. 
Over to you, Saeed. Thank you, Bina, and thank you, everyone. So yes, um, I'm really feeling great uh, to see all the faces and all the names here. And this is a great opportunity to share views and everything. So yes, uh, reading between the lines, history and nation in Bangladesh. So this is a paper basically about, that talks about the relationship between history and nation, uh, or you can say how nation and uh, it's like nation and nationalism uh, impacts uh, on the history writing uh, practices in Bangladesh. And to evaluate that relationship, um, I have chosen uh, 1971 as uh, the case study. Uh, and I would start with the question, what are the blind spots of the existing his historiographical uh, uh, instances on 1971? Uh, what I'm missing there, um, and for me, uh, like, of course, his, uh, historians and scholars have their different choices and preferences. Uh, for me, the choice is like, uh, I can see like uh, women, violated women, and uh, number one, and number two, uh, the Biharis are uh, to be, if we, if, if we want to be politically correct, it's Indian emigre. Uh, following uh, uh, followed up uh, by 1947 uh, partition. So yes, those are the two blind spots, and I will start the discussion. Uh, I, I, I will try to unfold my argument uh, by uh, talking about these two blind spots. First the thing is, whenever we start talking about the relationship between nation and history, we all know that every nation erases some episodes of its history and in some cases conceal or erases some episodes and on the other hand it glorifies some other uh, episodes like they try to stretch some glorious episodes and in some cases squeeze or like erase out simply take off some episodes so uh, and uh, actually uh, a nation state and uh, nationalist historiography requires a smooth narrative to avoid the awkwardness, to deal with the others within the nation. So in the case of when we are talking about the women and the Harris in 1971, this is this awkward, uh, these are these awkward points when nation and nationalist historiography hesitates at how to configure, how to deal, how to encounter uh, these uh, uh, issues. So, uh, and uh, the thing is, uh, in some cases, uh, they take it out, erase out. In some cases, uh, national, nationalist history is silenced about women or Biharis of 1971. In some cases, they make uh, a tailor-made presence of them or talk about something else simply. So uh, this is about, um, I will start about uh, talking about these two points, uh, one after another. First, the scholars are in agreement uh, in general that women and violated women like rape victims and uh, women, those who had gone through enormous violences during the 1971 war, uh, has remained silent mostly in the nationalist historiography in Bangladesh. But then there is this notion of public secrecy that Mukherjee has used, uh, like that Bangladeshi society uh, not really uh, concealed it uh, uh, wholesale, there are, uh, there are their presence of the Biranganas, there are presence of the violated women, but in a certain way. So it's interesting to see like, uh, when, uh, whereas Saikia says that uh, talking about the women in 1971, violated women in 1971, it's like sight of shame or like Vinada said that uh, raped, uh, raped, uh, raped person uh, are like, uh, fugitive uh, in the nationalist historiography. Like nationalist historiography really can't deal with the agonies, with the experiences, with the dilemmas, with the uh, pains and sufferings, or their effort to uh, like accommodate themselves with the, within the nation state and um, a nation and state, uh, national and status project. So this is the thing, uh, like uh, there is this agreement, uh, uh, in general, that in the 1971 history uh, of war, in the 19, uh, 1971 war history, 
uh, women are not uh, adequately represented and represented in a particular way. I can just uh, remember one example from uh, Nayanika Mukherjee's work, like she was describing about one display, uh, like how uh, Liberation War Museum in Bangladesh has dealt with the issue like, at first when the museum has started, there was no display uh, on the uh, Virangonas. And then uh, after their uh, a, a second and uh, uh, like further attempt, they have put on a display, but only with a text, only with titles in English, not in Bangla. So it's interesting, like the way the hesitation or the awkwardness uh, was like there. On the other hand, about the Biharis, the question is, do Biharis at all exist in the 1971 historiography? What happened to them actually? Uh, apart from vilifying the Biharis as the traitor, as equivalent to Razakar and those things, uh, are there any other space for the Biharis in the nationalist history? Like there is this concept of Saikia, uh, when Saikia says double unhoming, or there is this uh, concept uh, that Dina Siddiqui has used about the statelessness of the Biharis. So it's interesting to see, like, uh, what I can see, like, about the case of the Biharis, to deal the Biharis in 1971, the pretext of 1947 was a must. But historians in Bangladesh uh, precisely segregated these two events, like 19... They don't really try to relate 1947 until recently. They don't really try to relate 1947 and 1971. And whenever they did it, they try to deal them as antithesis to each other. And on the other hand, there is this relationship. If you look at the Indian emigrants' faith, like why they came here, what was their expectation, what was their de desire, what was their desire from the state they thought that they, this would be their homeland. And with, an, with the process of unhoming, unhoming from India, unhoming from uh, uh, like uh, Bihar or uh, Uttar Pradesh, uh, these people came to here. Yeah, and they thought the nation is there for them. And the nation then slipped away from their hands and it became a Bengali nation state. So this double unhoming, like what was their emotion? What was their dilemma during those heydays of 1971? What was their like we know that some of them has taken uh, have uh, some of them have sided with pakistan and some of uh, them have participated in the atrocities but in general what is the feeling of the community and how uh, the history in bangladesh about 1971 has dealt with that so that that is another question that largely in the bangladeshi nationalist historiography uh, there is no place for this uh, biharis so the question is like uh, so this is these are the two other of the nationalist history uh, in 1971. One other is the violated women, women, and the second other is the Biharis. And I I should mention I should acknowledge the recent scholarships on both the areas that scholars uh, in in recent years, like in the last dec decades, uh, the last decade has contributed uh, in these two blind spots and they have made significant they, there has been made significant pro, uh, progress yet the nationalist history in general still feels still find itself awkward to deal with these uh, two issues so and then there is this uh, uh, little chances like what uh, van Schindel many years ago has written about the historiographical practice in bangladesh van Schindel says that bangladesh historiography need to be decolonized so this is an interesting, uh, like Dina Siddiqui uh, used this phrasing from uh, like uh, this coinage of Ben Schindel about the Bangladeshi historiography while talking about the statelessness of the Biharis. So uh, like people in Bangladesh have been trying in recent, like scholars uh, from Bangladesh or outside Bangladesh who were dealing with the 1971 have been trying to accommodate or stretch the canvas of 1971 and accommodate these others these marginals of the history uh, in the canvas. But then at the same time, like, uh, like I can also remember the work of Afsan Chaudhry on like Grame de Kattor or Hindu de Kattor, like bringing up regional history, bringing up people's voices and try to stretch further and go beyond the nationalist uh, rhetorics or go beyond the 
nationalist framework of history. But the thing is, uh, my point is, so uh, what I have added here, I have added nothing new so far. Like I just acknowledged the previous scholarship and I just identified the women in 1971 and the Biharis in 1971 as the other of history in 1971. And that, that is nothing new. So my point is, we have to address at least three things. First, uh, there is this uh, narrative of sacrifice and heroism about 1971. Yes, there was this story of sacrifice. There is this saga of sacrifice. There is this saga of uh, like heroism. But we also have to go beyond that. It's not that all the Bengalis were innocent and naive and like they were just victim of the situation. Bengalis also have taken part. This, is, this was a war. And in the war, the communities got entangled with each other. So it's interesting to see like what Saitya says that communities bounded to each other, turned to each other as enemies. So this is the point where we should look for. We should actually acknowledge what Bengalis also have did to the Biharis, to the others uh, in, within, the, uh, within this cartographic uh, uh, sphere. So that is one thing, like we really have to go beyond the Trump and voices of sacrifice and uh, heroism, but we also should acknowledge our, uh, we, we also should acknowledge our historical responsibility, what we have done to the others in our nation state in our newly forming nation state in 1971, what we have done to the Biharis in 1971, that should be addressed, number one. Number two is uh, we usually feel comfortable to say that it was internal colonization under the Pakistani regime. So whenever we talk about East Pakistan, we say this is the West Pakistani colonization and these things, and we say the repression of the Pakistani state, which is absolutely fine, but we usually don't tend to go beyond the rhetorics. We usually don't tend to go beyond the monolithic characterization of Pakistan. How the state of Pakistan unfolded day by in, uh, through the day-by-day -day incidents. There are loads of archival materials in Dhaka sitting there in, the, in, the, in our national archive and historians and social researchers have a lot to do really to deal with these evidences. And really we have to show how if it is if we are claiming that this is a colonize this is a case of colonization internal colonization beyond the economic rhetoric or beyond the rhetoric of economic exploitation we really should go to that point that how the pakistani state deals with in my elsewhere in my phd work i have uh, said that the state of pakistan has dealt with fear and suspicion as two constituent element of the state how that has been un that had been unfolded all through these months in 19, before, like all through these years, uh, like 24 years under the Pakistani rule. So we should go to look that, uh, we should engage with the East Pakistan regime, the East Pakistani period, and to, to understand the state of Pakistan and how it, uh, 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 and its attitude toward East Bengal. The third part is from a very nationalist perspective, there is huge applause Huge gratitude, huge tone of gratitude toward India as the savior, as the friend of Bangladesh, uh, of our, which is of course, which has got elements of truth. But then again, we should go beyond that big truth as well, because uh, like India was keen. On the other hand, scholars have argued that India was keen to cut the Muslim Pakistan down to size. So, uh, and India has reason for that because they want to pacify the Bengal border. They want this land, this piece of land, uh, like uh, tamed so that they don't have trouble in the following years. So they have reasons, geopolitical reasons to participate in the, in the 1971 war. So this is interesting that if we just say that this is friendship and this is goodwill gesture from India and we just express our gratitude, that is okay, but that is not enough. We should go beyond that and we should say about, we should speak about India's role uh, and engage with these rhetorics. And then there is this, all these uh, play, debates about the number game. Whenever, they, uh, a viol whenever historians deal with the violence past, there's this issue of number game, politics of number, 
and the claiming of number. There's this issue of genocide. Some people say it is politicide. Some people say it is uh, ethnocide. And like some say genocide. So Bangladeshi scholars, really Bangladeshi historiographers, Bangladeshi history writers really have to deal with this issue. Why, if somebody says that this is not, thank you, Vina, I will, I will just conclude. Uh, uh, the Bangladeshi historian really have to engage, really have to answer with him that why, uh, why I'm going to argue that this is genocide or not. If I'm saying that this is not genocide, I have to have my reason. If I want to say no, if I have to assert that this is genocide, somebody else is saying this is a genocide, like Saikia. I find her book fascinating, but at some part, I find that uh, we can argue uh, this uh, about this idea when she is saying that this is not genocide. So if we have to do that, we have a lot to offer. We have a lot to do. Uh, uh, intelligentsia, historians, social researchers on 1971 has a lot to do to dismantle, uh, to go beyond their nationalist monoliths and to engage with the sophisticated arguments and bring up and deal with the complicated and newer issues. So I think that is all for, from me today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Saeed, for that powerful uh, presentation and reminding us that uh, uh, despite all the research and the discussion and building on the scholarship over the last two decades in particular, we have a lot of uh, new work to do and we need to also be a bit open and go beyond the nationalistic understanding of how we think about the 1971 war uh, and how we actually want to move forward in writing about the, uh, writing about the history of Bangladesh. Um, I now turn to Dr. Laliuddin, our second speaker today. Uh, Laili is a Leverhulme's uh, early career fellow at the School of Politics and International Relations at Queen Mary University of London. Laili is a political and social historian of modern South Asia, bringing together interdisciplinary questions on religion, class, and mass politics. Her research reconstructs subaltern political thought and movements in the context of decolonization, state formation, and the Cold War. Lali is currently uh, finishing her uh, manuscript, and we are very much looking forward to reading this. Uh, the book is titled Land of Eternal Eid, Making and Unmaking Pakistan, 1930s to 1971. Lali's paper today is titled We Are the 95% Subaltern Internationalist Futures of the 1957 Kogmari Shomelon. Laili, over to you. Thank you, Bina. This, um, it's very hard to follow on from Saeed, uh, but I'll try. Um, it, it's also difficult to be organizing and delivering a paper at the same time. So apologies um, if the paper doesn't really sort of meet expectations. This talk is part of a broader paper that offers a micro history of the Gagmari Shamalan exploring political aesthetics and subaltern internationalism in 1950s Pakistan. The focus of the presentation today is to foreground that rich strain of anti-imperialism that was present in the politics of East Pakistan, the histories of which have been overshadowed by that master narrative of ethno-linguistic nationalism in the making of 1971. This was not your prosaic politics of anti-imperialism, but grounded in subaltern life worlds and cultures and spoke to futures of Afro-Asian internationalism, solidarity, and peasant laughter. In February 1957, the Awami League, the ruling party in East Pakistan, held their council convention at Kagmari, a small sleepy village 50 miles north of Dhaka, the political capital of East Wing. The Kagmari Shamalon, described as a mela, a festival, a Shanskritik Shamalon, a cultural gathering, and an Afro-Asian cultural convention had profound consequences for the politics of Pakistan and Bangladesh. The event precipitated the breakup of the Awami League, the most popular political party in the East Wing, during the only time that they held power, both in the province and the center prior to the 1971 war. This split over the issues of foreign policy marked the radical entry of international affairs and internationalism 
into domestic politics. This was remarkable because there are few historical instances, if any, where domestic parties that were not explicitly communist have fractured over non-domestic issues. Over the course of six days, Awami League delegates and visitors from the wider region debated, discussed the Cold War Afro-Asian politics, the military pacts, anti-imperialism and decolonial futures in a large rapidly constructed tent city in Gagmari. Conversations on national and international politics often confined to parliamentary chambers, university halls, debating clubs, and the mansions of Dhaka migrated to the rural Moidan of Gagmari, foregrounding the participation of those excluded from the formal sphere of politics. And it is in these unlikely settings that the demand for radical anti-imperial love friendships and solidarity with the third world triumphed over the case for more arms spending and military pacts with the United States and other associated powers. The subaltern was not the parochial subject and nor the elite, the international actor as, traditional, as traditionally imagined. So why had the Awami League Council Convention been called in Kagmari in 1957? In late 1956, Awami League was at the height of its power. Sohrawadi was the Prime Minister of Pakistan and Atar Rahman Khan was the Chief Minister in East Pakistan. However, this power was to come at a cost. Sohrawadi had done a U-turn on the party's stated position on foreign policy, as well as provincial autonomy. At a talk at Dhaka University in December 1956, he accused those who did not agree with him, who did not agree with the military pacts, Sento, Sieto, the Baghdad Pact, of being anti-nationals, something that we're all familiar, a term that we're all familiar with. So in many ways, there was nothing unusual about Suharwadi's position. It echoed that of his predecessors, the former Pakistan rulers. But Suharwadi was also the leader of Awami League, and this was a complete U-turn from the party's stated position since 1953. The demand for complete withdrawal from bilateral and multilateral security agreements and the demand for a free and independent foreign policy. Now, the founder and president of the party, Maulana Bashani, was all too aware how far the party had shifted from their original position. His time with international left organizations and figures abroad strengthened his commitment to anti-imperialism and third world solidarity. For Bashani, the question of foreign policy was not outside of everyday politics, but in intimately tied to the politics, to the question of sovereignty power and the fate of Pakistan. The people could not really be the masters of Pakistan, especially if they were tied into these asymmetrical relationships of power and being drawn into wars that were not of their making. So conscious of this imminent showdown between him and Sohrawadi, Bashani called for the Awami League Council Convention to be held in Gagmari in February 1957. The organizers of Gagmari put out advertisements titled Deshad Dak, the call of the nation in various newspapers. Bashani appealed to the, quote, 95% of those who were poor cultivators, laborers, blacksmiths, potters, etc., and with all those whose money the country runs, end quote, to attend the Shamalon. The Awami League Party political convention, usually a closed door session, was now thrown open to all of the people that Sohrawadi and the other senior Awami League leaders did not find necessary to include in their discussions on Pakistan's future. Kagmari was a changed landscape over the period of the Shamalong. Those who organized or attended the event described how this backward village was transformed into to an Ostai Rajdani, a temporary capsule. This was not just a remark on the thousands of people that descended onto the small village, including the prime minister, the chief minister of East Pakistan, politicians, international guests, and foreign diplomats, but a reference also to this infrastructural and aesthetic makeover that the village received. What do I mean by that? So the expression, all roads lead to Kagmari, was in common use over this period. Now, this was not just a simple turn of phrase, but an actual representation of the massive network of unmetalled roads that were constructed to enable attendees from different parts of East Pakistan to travel to Kagmari. Now, the construction of these unmetal road, roads stood in stark contrast to the monumental failure of the recent road building project between Dhaka and Tangai. 
1952, an Italian road building firm had secured a contract to put down thousands of miles of road in Eastern Gaul, connecting Dhaka to outlying districts and towns. However, since 1954, bitter, long and fruitless wrangles between the provincial government and Italian contractors had meant that the machines were turned off and laid to rust. 25 miles of built roads were washed away by floods and a debt of five crore rupees were owed to the central government. But the roads weren't the only sort of physical transformation. The sights, sounds and smells that one would associate with small towns and villages of East Mongol were not to be found. Instead, what the residents and encounter, sort of attendees encountered was this well-lit village that was connected to the electricity grid, a constant supply of clean water, latrines which produced no strong and strange odors, huge furnace ovens used to cook food fit for foreign guests and medical arrangements on standby. The estate of the former Maharaja of Santosh, unused and abandoned since partition, recovered some of its earlier power and splendor in its new role as the actual site of the Shamalam. So why was this important? Why was this infrastructural makeover important? Now, roads and electricity, of course, have a basic function, the circulation and exchange of capital, goods, peoples and ideas. But infrastructure sim does not simply have a technical function. They are objects of collective fantasies and desires. Roads and electricity are simultaneously symbols of an experience as progress, modernity and freedom. And the city, by extension, becomes invested with similar ideas and emotions. On the other hand, villages are endowed with fixed and essentialized qualities of being deeply hierarchical, unequal and mythical spaces. So the rural village, which had captivated the anti-colonial nationalist imagination, lost much of its political currency during the post-colonial period. The dominance of the urban over the rural was apparent in East Pakistan by the mid-1950s. In September 1956, as villagers poured out of boats and ferries onto the riverbanks of Dhaka to take part in a hunger march, the police fired shots at them and killed a number of them. The city was where people came to articulate basic socio-economic and political claims of these seen by the modern state. The changing infrastructure and aesthetics in Kagma presented a vision of the power and possibilities contained within rural spaces and constituencies, a role otherwise denied to them. The village did not have to continue to be marked by stubborn decline and immiserization. It could be revived and reimagined, not as some bygone, not as some romanticized version of a village of a bygone era, but as a place that could boldly face the future if equipped with infrastructure. But we should also see these transformations as something more than just reproducing these, the power of the city. Perhaps conversely, the changes were also there to mock those in power who could only be lured to the village through the availability of the creature comforts or the veneer of modernity. So Bashani used Kagmari to rebuke those in the Awami League, such as Suharadi, who thought politics could only happen in modern spaces. And by showing that the peasants and other rural inhabitants were as modern, progressive, and capable of political thought as the urban elite counterparts, Kagmari displaced elite knowledge and power. Bashani had unveiled the radical and transformative potentialities of these collective endeavors, the capital in a village in which labor emerged as the connective tissue between people, spaces, and politics. After all, the prime minister had come to discuss the future of Pakistan with peasants and workers. The Shambhalon was a manifestation of Jacques Ronsier's principle of axiomatic equality, the equality of anyone with anyone, a space of radical equality. So there we have the cultural sort of, you know, the aesthetic makeover. I'll turn to some of the cultural elements quickly. So Bashani was no stranger to sort of organizing political events with cultural components, but he had organized um, Kagmari for a specific reason. Bashani argued that the Awami League could not hoodwink the people for long and that the Bichar Homota, the ability to judge, and the Buddhi Bibetana, the intelligence and thought was not to be underestimated. Kagmari was turned into a pedagogical space which could appeal to those specific qualities of intelligence and judgment of the subaltern constituencies. Bashani saw Kagmari as a crucial platform for cater building. He constructed a powerful and compelling case for autonomy, imperialism, and internationalism in ways that he could secure the hearts and minds of those of the festival. But how was this pedagogy to work? 
so central to the task, he was going to give people a sense of what futures built on subalternate internationalism would look like by prefiguring some of the political connections, relations, and emotions at Kagmari. The idea was that if people were able to see that it was possible to inhabit the world differently, then they would want to change it. So Bashani drew on three festival techniques and practices to persuade and educate his constituency. The use of gates, folk culture, and lectures. I'll mainly talk about the gates here. So the gates, numbering somewhere between 50 to 100, were one of the most striking sites of the Kagmari Shomalon. They were dotted the four to five mile route from Tangail to Kagmari. They were remarkable enough to merit a mention in the Sunil Gongopadhyay's epic novel, Purva Poshchim. Although Everts, the vice consul, the American vice consul was less generally, generous about them, describing them as flimsy arches. So the Kagmari gates had names of political, religious and cultural figures, mainly men emblazoned on them, ranging from Mao, Ataturk, Shakespeare, Prophet Muhammad, to the more regional and local leaders such as Gandhi, Chitranjan Dash, Haji Shariatullah, Rabindranath Tagore. But it was Jinnah, not the Prophet, whose name was printed on the most lavish and highest number of gates. Even so, there was no serious attempt to arrange these gates or to endow any ornamental or hierarchical privilege on any identifiable category. So these names had different levels of familiarity and associations for the audience, but it's possible that the group who derived some, if not the most pedagogical benefits from the gates were the workers and peasants for whom many of these names as they rolled off their tongues must have seemed foreign and unfamiliar. It's not possible to retrieve the stories that were told or imagined by these subaltern constituencies as they walk through the gates and notice the prophet's name before and after rows of unfamiliar names. But perhaps some speculation can be allowed when we do these kind of histories. It is possible that the role of arches, a structural feature in Mughal imperial architecture, paradoxically played a similar as well as a radical, radically different function at Kagmari. Historically, they have denoted the king's rule and power between and the connection between different spaces. But the arches at Kagmari demonstrated a similar veneration for authority, but it was not vested in a single individual idea past of geography, but rather to multiple um, and variegated geography, people's religions and cultures. Where the military packs offered belonging to an exclusive club of nation states, the gates were infused with a spirit of radical equality. The peasants and laborers were shown that they were part of this wider, richer, moral and cultural universe, where examples and lessons from Mao, Lenin, or Abraham Lincoln could be drawn upon, although perhaps not given the same weight. So the haphazard ordering of the gates were perhaps not arbitrary or in, as initially assumed, but designed to place emphasis on the connections between those life worlds. Revolutionary cultures was what connected them rather than what divided them. So shouts of long live global solidarity could be heard at the end of the conference in the debate between Sarwadi and Bashani. I'll finish quickly, Bina. Um, so the fe festival noise signaled a dramatic defeat for the prime minister of Pakistan who found himself unable to convince the assembled crowds of peasants and workers and other groups of a future of nuclear war. This defeat, this defeat um, would soon be reversed though. So Hrawadi in Dhaka would win a few months later in his position and on his foreign policy, uh, sort of policy position in, different, in a different setting altogether. And this would lead to Bashani's resignation from Awami League and the formation of the National Awami Party, which after the banning of the Communist Party in 1954 emerged as the foremost left-leaning and progressive party in Pakistan. So just to sort of wrap up quickly, what lessons does Kagmari offer? Kagmari Shomalon reframes our understanding of the history, politics, and aesthetics of the left in South Asia. As the historical event, Kagmari has received inadequate attention from scholars. It acquires significance mainly for Bashani's remark of salam to the center, seen as an indication of the prevalence of Bengali nationalist sentiment in East Pakistan. So Kagmari has been just read as another event in the seamless narrative of Bengali nationalism. But Kagmari shows us actually that even at this high point of Bengali representation, the fault lines of Bengali nationalism as an insufficiently hegemonic project, unable to suppress other political national aspirations and possible futures. Kagmari offers a more radical narrative, actually. 
the prefigurative politics of futures beyond nationalism. Dagmarie was about the, the forging of a new political community that rejected strong and muscular nationalism in favor of effective solidarities and connections between the new de newly decolonized nations. The freedom and dignity of the 95% could be realized only through a class-based internationalism. So just my last comment here, some of the most important progressive political movements of recent years have come from occupied space, Shaheen Bagh, the Herrera Square, and the Indignados movement. These and other creative protests have worked, reworked and combined existing cultural forms for progressive ends. The tr this tradition of occupation of space and cultural politics has a long history and we see at Kagamari a unique South Asian example. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Hilaili, uh, for this fascinating presentation. Um, from your portrayal, for me, and I know uh, many uh, in the audience as well, for us, Kogmari really came alive, actually, through your portrayal. So before uh, introducing our final speaker, I would like to remind you that if you have comments, if you have questions, um, interesting feedback or resources, please uh, send us uh, those through chat box uh, and we will monitor those. And if you're interested to also speak uh, after the final presentation, uh, we could also unmute the microphone. So, I would like to introduce our final speaker today, Mohammed Sajjadur Rahman. Sajjad uh, is finalizing uh, his PhD at the Stressler Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Clark University. Sajjad uh, is uh, also an alumni from Dhaka University Department of International Relations, my own department, Sajjad. Uh, Sajjad also completed um, another master's in terrorism studies from the Middlebury Institute of International Studies and at Monterey, uh, California. His current research focuses on post-war justice in Bangladesh. What Sajjad hasn't included in his bio is also uh, that Sajjad is currently developing this incredible archive on Bangladesh and 1971. Um, so we welcome anyone who has documents also to connect to Sajjad uh, after the event. Sajjad's paper today is titled, The Politics of Forgiveness, The Collaborators' Trials, The Case of Dr. Malik, and Bangladesh's Experience with Post-War Justice. Over to you, Sajjad. Thank you, Binadi. Um, and thank you, Laili, Saidbhai, Nasrinapa, and Hana for giving me the opportunity to share my work today. Um, I need to share uh, the screen now. All right, can you see? Okay, all right. So I will talk about an ongoing project that deals with post war justice in Bangladesh, particularly the case of Dr. Malik. The presentation is not about the legal analysis of the tribunal or the merit of the case. Rather, I'll focus mainly on some of the documents I have found and what they reveal about the international dimension of the case and about Bangladesh's decision to declare general amnesty in November 1973. So the time period for this presentation is between January 1972 and December 1973. This work is entirely based on archival papers. Before going into the details, I'll briefly state some of the facts about the collaborators' trials and Mr. Malik. <clears throat> Soon after the liberation war in 1971, Bangladesh faced various challenges in dealing with the crimes of the local collaborators who allegedly supported the Pakistani army and opposed the creation of Bangladesh. After the war, the government took immediate action to ensure accountability and to end revenge. On January 24, 1972, the Bangladesh collaborators order was promulgated by presidential decree. The act provided for the prosecution of collaborators before special tribunals. Um, being a collaborator itself became a criminal offense under the law. The other acts it criminalized 
criminalized were drawn from Bangladesh Penal Code. However, many potential suspects were never charged because they fled into exile. The government set up 73 special tribunals to try those who collaborated with the old regime. Let me also briefly state a short biography of Dr. Malik to help you understand why his case attracted international attention in 1972. Born in Chuadanga in 1903, Mr. Malik was an eye surgeon, a trade union leader, diplomat, and the last governor of East Pakistan. He studied in the Vishwa Bharati University in West Bengal and got higher degree in ophthalmology from Vienna in 1931. His wife, Elfit Fatima Malik was German. Malik started his career as an eye surgeon in Kolkata and later he joined the trade union movement in 1936. He became the first president of all Pakistan Trade Union Federation. He served as ambassador of Pakistan to Switzerland, Austria, Yugoslavia, China, the Philippines, and High Commissioner to Australia and New Zealand. In August 1969, he was appointed Minister of Health labor works and social welfare and remained in that position till February 1971. Later in July 71, as special assistant to the President Yahya Khan, he was responsible for the supervision and coordination of relief and rehabilitation activities for the refugees. During the War of Liberation of Bangladesh, Malik was appointed Governor of East Pakistan on 31st of August 1971 and took oath to office on 3rd September. On 14 December 1971, while Dr. Malik and his cabinet members were preparing for a meeting, the governor house was partly damaged by the airstrike of the Allied force, and he, along with the members of the cabinet, resigned and took shelter in the Hotel Intercontinental, which was declared as no war zone by the International Red Cross. Dr. Malik was detained secretly from that hotel after 16th of December. Although Dr. Malik's case attracted international attention and it was the most publicized trial in Bangladesh in 1972, there was no academic study available on this particular case until this year. One of the main reasons for this lack of academic interest in this case is because of the complete lack of documentary evidence. The Center for Genocide Studies at Dhaka University published My Bangla Report in September 2021 and this is the only public study available on this subject. There is literally no document available on collaborators' trials at the National Archive of Bangladesh or, in, or at any public libraries. It has also been reported in newspapers that documents on the cases under the collaborators' trials have mostly been destroyed. Only a few verdicts have been reported in the Dhaka Law Reports DLR. In fact, I could not locate the verdict of Malik's trial and had to rely on newspaper reports for this study. However, in the last three years, I was able to locate and collect important documents from various international archives, particularly from the UK, which were quite unknown uh, to Bangladeshi scholars. These documents, particularly on Malik's case, give us a unique opportunity to explore the viewpoints of Dr. Malik's British lawyers on the nature of the act and the trial process in general. They also provide key information on the British policy toward Bangladesh's decision to hold trials for the collaborators. They also reveal the involvement of Pakistani lobbying groups who had interest in this particular case. Most importantly, these documents provide key information on the decisions of the Bangladeshi leadership regarding general amnesty. Uh, in the previous slide, uh, these are the archives that I have collected um, various documents from, documents in the form of letters, telegrams, and official records, of course. Um, Malik's trial began on October 7, 1972, and the verdict was given on 20th of November, 1972. Mr. Malik was sentenced to life imprisonment for waging war against Bangladesh. He was not given death penalty considering his age and past contributions. Dr. Malik's lawyers, decided to appeal against the verdict and the appeal was filed in the second week of January, 1973. We do not have any further information about what happened to the appeal. Later on May 16, 1973, 
the government announced strict conditional amnesty for collaborators under which neither Dr. Malik nor any of his cabinet members were released. However, under the relatively flexible general amnesty announced on November 30, 1973, Dr. Malik was released the following month. Some interesting facts that I found in the documents about the trial are as follows. His principal defense lawyer was Mr. Abdul Rahman Khan. Riley was talking about Mr. Abdul Rahman Khan, uh, who was the then who was then a leader of opposition party named Jatiya League. He was also a former founding member of Aum League. Interestingly, Mr. Abdul Rahman Khan's name was actually suggested by Mr. David Ingalls, a member of the British Labour Party and a human rights activist. It should be mentioned that his brother, Mr. Martin Ennels, was the Secretary General of Amnesty International. According to one letter by Dr. Kamal Hussain, the then law minister, Mr. Martin Ennels also suggested a Bangladeshi lawyer's name who defended Dr. Malik. Now, two British lawyers, Mr. Robert McLennan MP and Sir Dingle Foot, a former Labour MP, agreed to be the legal advisor of Dr. Malik for the case. The document suggests that a Pakistani organization called Society for the Defense of Bengal was bearing their cost and Bangladesh government was aware of this. Mr. James Alfred Davidson, who was a British Deputy High Commissioner at Dhaka, was concerned that the involvement of Sir Dingaku and Mr. McLennan would cause serious problems for the British-Bangladeshi relationship since Bangladeshi law did not give them the right of audience in domestic court. Eventually, they were not allowed to present Mr. Malik. And this made Mr. Neil McDermott, who was the Secretary General of the International Court of Justice, very upset. He expected that the President of Bangladesh, Justice Chaudhary, would intervene to resolve the crisis. In a letter to Sir Dingerford, dated December 1, 1972, Mr. Neil McDermott wrote, I feel, I feel very angry about the decision, which I regard as a breach of the assurance which I was given. I fear that there is no prospect of getting the decision changed by private representations. I suggest that every effort should be made to get the maximum publicity and protests organized. Mr. McNamara, in fact, argued in another letter to Dr. Kumar Hussain for either changing the law of Bar Council of Bangladesh or giving temporary citizenship for these councils so that they can be enrolled in Bangladeshi Bar. Dr. Kamal Hussain declined both suggestions and assured that Mr. Malik would get fair trial. After failing to secure the right of audience in Bangladesh, Mr. McLennan went back to London and wrote a letter to the British Foreign Secretary, Sir Alec Douglas Hume, indicating that Bangladesh was actually expediting the anti-trial process in an attempt to put pressure on Pakistan. He also wrote a long critical piece on the tribunal, Trials of Error, Trials of Errors, in Guardian on December 1, 1972. However, the British official in Dhaka, Mr. Davidson, informed London of this about his own criticism of Macmillan's writing and other propaganda activities, which suggests that the British officials in Dhaka did not agree fully with the lawyers' viewpoints about the trial process. But the documents also suggest that the British government on a number of occasions urged Bangladesh to limit the number of trials this was their position regarding the proposed war crimes tribunal too. What is clear from the documents is that the British government did not consider the collaborators' trials conducive to peace in South Asia. While in public, they regarded the trials as an internal matter of Bangladesh. Privately, the British officials expressed their concerns about the negative implications of the trial on the post-war peace process in the region. Pakistan's reaction to the Malik trial were predictably angry and President Bhutto declared himself deeply shocked and distressed by the verdict. A Pakistani lobby group, Pakistan-American Friendship Association, headed by Mr. Asghar Chaudhary, continued to propagate against the trial and invited Mr. Dingalfoot, the USA, to deliver lectures on the problems of the trial with the promise that all expenses will be taken care of by the organization. Mr. Neil McDermott declined this offer due to his other professional engagement. Now in general, there are three types of causes that are usually discussed within Bangladesh for explaining the decision to declare general amnesty in 1973. The Prime Minister Sheikh Mujibur Rahman's magnanimity and his commitment towards bringing peace, 
domestic political pressure, particularly from Maulana Bashani and Atta Rahman Khan, and the increasing criticism had been the politicization of the trial process at the time. But as you have just noticed, there were external pressures too. But beyond these reasons, the documents I've seen do indicate that Bangladesh authority might have been contemplating about declaring general amnesty from the very early stage of the collaborators' trials. And this is the second most important theme that emerges from these documents. In a State Department, in a US State Department memo dated 15th of December 1972, it was reported that during his conversation with Ambassador Mayor on 10th of December 1972, Mr. Mohit, the Bangladeshi diplomat who later became a famous uh, finance minister, reported the possibility of a general amnesty. The memo says, he says that this as though he possessed some documentation for the apparent speculation. Mohit further guessed that if he were to visit Dhaka in two years, he would be able to call on the ex-governor at his home. Needless to say, Mr. Mohit had a warm, warm relationship with the governor and his family members. In a confidential telegram sent on November 20, 1972, Mr. Davidson reported that he went to see the former minister, uh, I'm sorry, foreign minister of the Samad Ajad with Mr. McLean just prior to the sentence of Dr. Malik and Mr. Nakhima left a letter with Samad for the Prime Minister, expressing the hope that Bangladesh government would show mercy. The sentiment was instantly accepted by Samad, who undertook to deliver the letter personally to Mujib before his departure for Britain that evening. The telegram mentions, Samad, who spoke sympathetically, said that he and the Prime Minister understood the pressures on Malik and knew the kind of man he really was. Samad then added that Malik, who had been treated throughout with every courtesy, might not indeed have had to stand trial at all if Pakistan recognition had taken place as expected during August. If this had happened, it had been Mujib's intention to announce a general amnesty on his return home after his operation in England. Such statements indicates that Bangladesh too might have approached the collaborator's trials from within the broader context of securing recognition from Pakistan and ensuring peace in the region. So in conclusion, it's fair to say that the documents essentially give us a complex picture of a post-war situation of a newly independent country where government had to tackle both internal and external pressures while ensuring justice. We can also think about the following two questions for future research. To what extent foreign pressures affects transitional justice in countries of the South? And does amnesty work when the public is ill informed about the reconciliation process? Before ending, I'd like to make an announcement that the documents of this research will be available in a book format next year. I'm working on that manuscript too. I'll end here. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sajat, for this very important presentation and uh, sharing with us uh, this part of history about which we know really little. So thank you for this presentation. Um, and with this, uh, our presenters have um, delivered their papers. If you have any comments or questions, we'd like to request you to uh, share those with us through the chat function. You could also, if you prefer to ask the question directly, you're welcome to do so. Please use the Zoom reaction function for this purpose uh, and uh, one of us will unmute you. Um, while we are waiting for questions, I have a, a one general question for all of you and a specific question for Saeed. I'll start with the specific question uh, for Saeed. Um, in terms of what you talked about, um, women uh, who were uh, targeted uh, in 1971 and the Biharis, so the extreme violence that um, they have experienced. And you talked about um, that this simultaneous responsibility 
of not only just recording their experience uh, and thinking about how we um, uncover those silences, but you've also actually expressed that this is not a homogeneous story. There are differences. And actually thinking about uh, those differences are important in learning about these issues. Um, so in terms of uh, pedagogy in Bangladesh, uh, in Jahanginagar University and elsewhere, in anthropology and sociology, how are you uh, and other colleagues uh, teaching about those methodologically that we need to think differently while we uh, read, uh, while we build our research uh, from the scholarship? How do we actually think about a critical methodology to teach our students to go forward and write differently? So this is a question to you. Um, uh, a question to all three of you. Um, all these three papers have been very thought provoking uh, in different ways. And this is not a way some of the other conferences and discussions of Bangladesh at 50. Um, has started. So these are really pushing the boundaries, uh, asking us uh, to be provocative, asking us for critical inquiry in terms of history and society, politics and culture. So in terms of your research, where do you see your um, contribution uh, from your particular kind of uh, findings and research that would make, that would uh, move Bangladesh's historic historiography forward. So this is a general question just to think about, not necessarily for any right and wrong answer. Uh, while I um, just pass it over to any of you, if you'd like to respond. Uh, I can see, as you have directed specific question to me, I can respond, but I can see Nayanika has raised her hand. So if she wants to add a question along the same line, I can take, uh, we can take, well, we can deal them together. Sure, um, Nanika, is your question on the same line? Please unmute yourself and ask. Um, mine is, uh, uh, can I be heard? Yes. Mine is less broad and more specific in terms of uh, some of the points that uh, Saeed raised. So I can wait or ask now, whichever is you decide. Uh, you can do it now and uh, yeah. Yeah, I think. Okay. All right. Well, first of all, thank you so much, everyone, uh, for organizing this conference, uh, Bangladesh at 50 conference by only Bangladeshi speakers. And um, this is uh, great. So thank you. And, and you're obviously clearly addressing various topics throughout this um, conference, uh, which have not, have just not been touched by many other conference that has been organized. So uh, massive thank you. Um, I want, I had a question for Saeed and also for uh, uh, Sajad. Um, um, so to Saeed, I wanted to ask, um, in some ways, the issue of the blind spot, of the, the Bihari question is obviously a clear blind spot, um, though it's emerging more um, within Bangladesh. But do you think the, the, the question around Biyangwana's or if you want to say Mohila Mukti or, um, you know, uh, survivors, um, is it a blind spot in Bangladesh? Uh, in some ways, I would think um, the Birangwana issue at one level, there is a rhetoric around the Birangwana or the, or the history of sexual violence is an important rhetoric that, that we hear to kind of precisely convey the horrors of 1971 in a, in a way which is horrific as, as you know, I kind of talk about how we constantly want to have the Birangwana figure as a figure of silence and as a horrific figure. So my question to you would be one, is it actually a blind spot? Second, um, uh, why do you think we we keep on hearing about the uh, idea of the figure of the Biyangwana as a, as as some something which is always silent? So you know that would be that would be interesting to hear because in some ways Bangladesh is a country which has done lots of things around the issue of sexual violence, which hasn't been done till date um, by most countries. Yet I hear most Bangladeshi scholars actually reiterating the the uh, issue of silence within Bangladesh. Obviously, there was silence. There is. Uh, there is a certain kind of narrative brought out by the way Firdos Yapa's account is 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 airbrushed, and a certain account of Firdos Yapa's is, is is portrayed. There is a silence in the narrative of the Biyangwana, but at the same time, I find it quite stunning that most Bangladeshi, um, uh, most people working on the Biyangwana 
would like to focus on the narrative of silence where there hasn't been silence. There is a massive public memory within Bangladesh. So I would like to address you to think, you know, we've talked about this before and it would be helpful to hear more. And, um, and second, um, uh, to such a, a really interesting, um, I actually a lot of notes <clears throat> that I kept on Mr. Malik's case um, when I was working in the other Gao archives, and I have this chapter on um, on the figure of the collaborator in this book called Traitors. Um, I don't know whether you have um, come across that. Um, and so I, I actually I have those notes from on Mr. Malik's case, which I took from the newspapers and when I was doing my archival work. <clears throat> and one thing just struck me is the second photograph. So who has taken the second photograph with the with the collaborators? Because there is one photograph I have in my absent, absent skin article about, <clears throat> which was taken by um, Kishor Parikh about uh, 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 basically what is seen as a famous lungi photograph that it is seen usually that the Pakistani army is apparently looking into the lungi of Bangladeshis, but actually Kishor Parikh's son tells me that it's actually Indian soldiers looking into the uh, lungis of collaborators. So there's a whole kind of captioning issue and the role of narratives of photographs. So I first wanted to ask who took that photograph. And second is, um, I wanted to pick up on the on the two big questions you raised at the end. Um, do you think um, the, 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 ter the term reconciliation is relevant in the case of Bangladesh? Or do we need to find some other kind of vocabulary for what the situation is in Bangladesh? Thank you, Narika. Um, maybe we could uh, just before the second round of questions, pass it back to the panelists. Uh, Said, over to you first. Yeah, thank you, Veena, and thank you, Narika, for this fascinating question. Um, first, I, I'm going to deal with Veena's question, uh, like uh, respond uh, to Veena's question. Uh, yes, uh, like I did uh, in my uh, PhD research on partition. I have uh, used a mixed method, like I have used, uh, I had limited access uh, to the archive. Uh, I have time constraint, of course, with the PhD, you know, with funding and everything and leave and everything. So, but I, uh, within the short period of time, I have used the archive, archival materials uh, in our national archive. But at the same time, I have done field research in borderland, typical anthropological field research, staying over there for uh, like three weeks at this rate, coming back to Dhaka, working in the archive for a week and going back to the field again. So this back and forth journey all through the uh, months I have spent in the field. So yes, this is a mixed method, but um, I'm also very much aware that uh, regarding reading archive or reading the materials in archive, you really need to be uh, subversive at some point, like what the subaltern studies uh, people have suggested that you have to uh, read against the grain, like uh, like read between the lines. So that is one part. But on the other hand, uh, while I was uh, doing uh, field work uh, and I was collecting the narratives, like oral historical accounts of the interlocutors there or the people who was part of my research. So uh, I have to remember my. I have to remind myself over and over again that there is these trends of accumulating or claiming that we are accumulating people's voices, but actually it is becoming part of my project. And often like liberation, the fascinating, and one of the most fascinating example is the Liberation War Museum in Bangladesh has this huge uh, archive of uh, oral historical uh, uh, oral historical accounts, but they just take these accounts in a way, decontext uh, decontextualize the accounts and uh, fit it fit in within the comfortable nationalist rhetorical historical framework. So yes, it's about the methodical question that you can use the mixed method, but on the other hand, while using the mixed method, yeah, you have to always uh, be keen that what you're doing, like whether you are trying to uh, like uh, put words in people's voices, like you, whether you are using them, tailor-made use it, you are uh, uh, making a tailor-made use of uh, people's narrative to fit in your project. So that is one. Or you allow, or you allow yourself as a researcher to unsettle, to get questioned, get uh, puzzled uh, with information coming from the field. You're allowing yourself to get puzzled and question and rethink your project. Like, 
I started with my, in my partition business, I started with nostalgia. I have got this middle class, secular Bengali middle class nostalgia in my mind about 1947, because I started with my father's journey. But on the other hand, when people started saying that we were very happy at the beginning and I got, okay, it's very different. And we have got this story or narrative of friends and like Sevier uh, of India during 1971. And people were raising their issues with refugee camp experiences in India during 1971, which is very complicated at the same time. So yes, uh, uh, you definitely can draw from different sources, but our, my uh, most important is how you're going to use them. That sensitization of the researcher and like kind of self-reflexivity, subjectivity, and allowing yourself to challenge. That is one thing. The other thing is, yes, Nayanika, your question about whether Birangana is a blind spot. I, I acknowledge the, the scholarships uh, researchers have brought in the, the, in the past decade, including you, Bina is here, uh, so, uh, Yasmin Saikia is here. Uh, Yasmin Saikia uh, uh, has, has contributed in that field. And then there is this like, uh, before everyone else, before the academia and intelligentsia, there was this oral history project from Aino Shalish Kendro, uh, on like from which uh, uh, Shaheen Akhtar has uh, fascinatingly developed the uh, novel uh, Talash. So Talash is there. So Tarek Masud's Narashundar is there. So neither Bihari nor uh, Violated Women are completely new as a uh, like uh, completely unexplored or unintervened areas on 1971. Uh, and of course, comparing to the Biharis, quote unquote the Biharis, comparing to them, yes, violated women, rape victims, Birangonas have been dealt by the researchers, at least addressed by the researchers in many more instances. That's I, that I acknowledge. And what you say, I also understand this idea of public memory and public secrecy at the same time, yeah. But the thing is, uh, I still think, uh, like I can understand that why still the researchers is emphasizing on the idea of silence and why they're talking about the silence because often the Biranganas are there, but the thing is, uh, the uh, narrative is sacrifice. The narrative of sacrifice is getting stronger day by day, like, it's, it's still there, like uh, that Biranganas have sacrificed their life, Mukti Jyotis have sacrificed their life. This self satisfying or uh, nation satisfying uh, narratives is there. So I think it's still, it's, if I say, if I don't say blind spot uh, uh, like right away, but we still think, I still think there is a lot to do in this area. That, that's what I think. And acknowledging, acknowledging the scholarship in, in recent time, including you and everyone else, I still think there is a lot to do on this area. Yes, thank you very much. Sorry, I have taken a lot. A lot no, no, that's all right. Thank you, Saeed. Um, and uh, before I go to the second round of questions, uh, I wanted to just pass the microphone over to Sajad, if you'd like to respond to Nayanika. Just so I also wanted to mention that we have uh, roughly 10 minutes left. Uh, if the organizers are okay, if we could go five more minutes over, then we have uh, another round of questions to respond to. Sajjad, over to you first. Um, thank you, Nainika, for the questions. Um, <clears throat> the, the image, the photograph that you talked about is taken by Jack Gara Palo. Uh, this is the record I have with me. Um, I got this image from Mukti Yuddha e archives collection, which they collect from different sources. I think it is originally uh, from Getty images. So, and, and the description was quite clear that those were uh, probably behind collectors and um, with four Bengali film fighters. So, that is that. Uh, the short answer for the second question is that I, um, if I consider, and many considers actually, um, the term reconciliation in a broader context, and that doesn't exclude 
the judicial process. So if you include judicial processes and, um, and other kinds of uh, reparation mechanism that Bangladesh um, has taken up recently, um, these are all part of the conciliation process, I believe. So that is my short answer. Thanks so much, Sajad. So I have, uh, on the second round, I have three questions. The first one is to Laili from uh, Dr. Naomi Hussain. It's on the chat box. Uh, it's about uh, the, um, uh, so I'll just like read it out for you, Laili. I particularly love the focus on political aesthetics and global South solidarity uh, in Cogmary. I wondered what are the legacies of this prefigurative political moment in contemporary political culture? Uh, and I have two other questions here I see. Um, I, uh, Saad Kassem, if you'd like to introduce yourself and ask the question briefly, over to you. Please be brief, thank you. Thank you, hi, I'm Saad. I'm at the University of Virginia and I'm an anthropologist in training. Uh, my question is uh, one to Said Firdos. Um, thank you for the presentation, but my question I think is broadly uh, based on a confusion. You keep on, uh, you've mentioned that, uh, you've suggested a couple of suggestions on how to go beyond the current historiography of Bangladesh, right? And you've, you keep on citing Afsan Chaudhry and Dina Siddiqui and all these novels and all these people. How are you engaging with these literature? If you could, if you could say so, because we're departing onto, if we are departing onto a new kind of historiography, a lot of these scholars have already addressed these issues. Um, so I just wanted to know what the crux of your engagement is with the already existing uh, bodies that are present. Because if we don't put the foreclosure together, how are we moving forward? If, if the if we don't foreground, um, okay. yes. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, I have to ask you all to be brief. Professor Shopinad, now over to you. Thank you, Bina. Uh, I'd like to elaborate some of the points made by Said Firdos regarding the blind spots of Bengali nationalist hist historiography. Now, he has pointed out the case of two, uh, two, two others, so to speak. And I think there are many others in this war. And the case that I want to draw your attention to is the vilification oh or ambiguity regarding the paharis of the Chittagong hate tracks in the historiography. Uh, uh, and I, since there isn't much time, just in terms of bullet points, there is this uncritical condemnation of the role of Raja Tridib Roy, in supposedly a collaborator of Pakistan, a willing collaborator, which can be questioned. It's a case study of how national enemies are produced, the production of the enemy. And, and yet I, we know uh, that individual Baharis actually tried to join the liberation forces. Ushatan Talukdar, a former commander of the Shanti Bahini, told me that he and some friends who had crossed over to join the liberation forces were screened out by army league officials and Indian intelligence. So the story of all Baharis being enemies and collaborators is a constructed one, and we need to sort of investigate this to a greater extent. Uh, the, having these multiple others also means that the construction of Bengali nationalism is kind of by negation, by default, made into this heroic tale of male Bengalis, which again, I think needs to be questioned. The other point I, I want to make is that there were many different wars and many different objectives in 1971. Uh, Said Fidos has pointed out the fact that one objective was to cut, you know, to cut down, break up Pakistan. But let me just add a few others. India had a great interest in crushing the Maoist movement, the Naxalites in West Bengal, and not just them, but also the much stronger Maoist movement than uh, which had built up in East, then East Pakistan, under the East Pakistan Communist Party ML and the Puro Bangla Communist Party ML. All of these movements were crushed after the war by common operations of the Rokhi Bahini in operation with the Indian uh, forces. 
there is also the war in terms of the war effort, the role of the Moody Bahini. I mean, here was the Bangladesh Liberation War being fought under the leadership of Tawyuddin and General Uspani. But in parallel, there was the Muji Bahini being trained by General Uban, which was not under the command of Usmani or Tawyuddin. They were also under Uban, uh, there were Tibetan guerrillas who were brought in to fight in the Chittagong Hill Tracks. And their primary objective was to get to fight the Mizo rebels in the Chittagong Hill Tracks. And I think to explicate what had happened in 1971, we need to take account of these multiple political trends, not only of nationalist politics, but also of transformative politics. Thank you, Shapan Bhai. Um, I have one more question on this round for Laili. It is on the chat uh, from Ninoy. Uh, Laili, you mentioned that Kogmari Shamelon is important for Afro-Asian solidarity and pedagogy of or in social movements. Would you please speak more to this? So these are the four questions and comments I have on this round. Over to our speakers. I'd invite um, I'd invite Lily to go first this time. Sure. Are you Thank right? you. I'm going to try and keep it short just because it's going to, yeah, we don't really have time. I mean, I can speak to the immediate, um, Naomi, thank you for your question. I can speak to sort of the immediate um, legacies of the Kogmari Shamalon, which, as I've said, some of these uh, sort of radical energies of the Kogmari Shamalon was sustained through the National Awami Party, which was the foremost left-leaning party and had this progressive manifesto, um, but sort of of land reform, but also thinking more sort of um, more broadly outside of this sort of nationalist, um, sort of, yeah, broadly outside of nationalism um, and thinking more sort of internationally as to how do we sort of extend our solidarities beyond um, that of within the sort of beyond that of the two wings. So, I mean, I mean, the legacies of the contemporary sort of the contemporary legacies, I mean, I think we have to look around and see where is the where are the festivals of anti imperialism in Bangladesh today, where are those festivals for South South solidarity when we're thinking about a sort of festivals we're thinking about very urban elite sponsored um, festivals, which we all uh, to a certain extent partake in, but I think we should also question you know where are you know, where are festivals that both, um, that have spaces where we're mingling, not just amongst our own classes, but within um, sort of with, with other classes as well. Um, and I think that's particularly the thing with Kagmari Shamalon was that it was a very co-constitutive sphere. It was a co-produced sphere by different classes. And, um, and, and this was very much also uh, a story of, um, sort of a story of the working class or a story of peasant and laborers co-producing a space that spoke of Afro-internationalism or South-South solidarity or war, a world without nuclear war. Um, I, I'm not sure what the contemporary legacies are, but I think we, I think it's an important question to ask whether we can build it. Um, so quickly, I, I think it's the same thing with Nirnoy, um, with, you know, in terms of what does Kagmari um, teach us or what is what, what is a pedagogical, pedagogical space of and I think it's about political noise I think Kagmari is a as a story of political noise what are the noises that are that can't be disciplined and I think laughter peasant laughter or subaltern laughter is one of those things that can't be disciplined that's disorderly that's transgressive and and where do we that that's pedagogy that's the pedagogy how do we draw out these things these noises and emotions that make um, the, uh, certain classes uncomfortable. But also, where do we celebrate labor? Kagmari Shamalon was a celebration of labor. It was labor that bought, that is that sort of turning the village into a capital that brought the prime minister to Kagmari. Um, and so where, you know, I, mean, I think that's the pedagogy of celebrating labor. Um, I'll end there. I think those were my questions. So. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lali. Sajjad uh, and Saeed, you have one minute each. I'm sorry. Sajjad, first over to you. Uh, yes, I just saw the question. Um, very briefly, um, uh, Ahmed Ratul's question 
um, about uh, later trials of the Raza cars and whether uh, it conflicts with the general amnesty. I think that's the question. I, I, and very briefly, I, I pose the second question, particularly for this reason. Um, and the initial answer would be that the political order within which uh, amnesty was declared changed drastically in 1975. And the conditions of amnesty, um, I think, diminished with that change. And that is why the reconciliation um, um, didn't really work in Bangladesh's case. I'm still thinking about this issue. So this is, this is purely an initial response to that. Um, so I'll, 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 I'm done with this question. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, Saeed, you have the last words. Uh, you had a question from Saad Qasim um, and I've sent one on chat box. Over to you, Saeed. Okay. Uh, so uh, Saad Qasim's uh, observation is right. Like uh, many people has already done the work and what's new and what I'm talking about. Yes, definitely. I acknowledge this uh, scholarship that has been done by fascinating scholars there. Uh, but the thing is, uh, like Gina Siddiqui wrote about the statelessness of the Biharis, but not actually she has uh, uh, talked about a social historical approach toward an alternative history of 1971. So what I'm going to suggest, like to uh, taking cue from all of them uh, to go for a social alternative social history of 1971, addressing the blind spots. And so you are right, there is the, no scholarship is absolutely new, like we take you from the previous scholars, but at the same time, I find that uh, uh, asking the Indocentric uh, uh, like bias about like India as a friend and India as a severe, we can go beyond that. We can look about the rhetoric of Pakistan as internal colonized, uh, Pakistani regime as internal colonizer, uh, but go beyond that, how that was translated in day-to-day -day life. So that is my priority about doing an alternative social history of 1971. And I uh, totally agree with you. It, it's not new, uh, like unique in like scholars have already done their work and, and we can only take you from them and assemble in a new uh, uh, framework. Uh, the thing is, um, you know, what Shapunadan said, unfortunately, I have missed Shapunadan's question because of the internet interruption. Uh, so, but I have uh, collected the question. It was, uh, Shapunda, please correct me. What about the other excluded, like indigenous group? Was, was that the case? Was, was that the question? We've muted him. I uh, okay. Uh, anybody can uh, re remember what was Shapunadan's? Question. Uh, Saeed bhai was just uh, offering his overview about Chittagong Hill tracks and Rajat Tridi boy and how we talk about that. Exactly. Can, no. I, yeah, can I just say that there are, I, the, point, the general point I wanted to make was that there are multiple others. In, so I, and I, I, I pointed out to the special case of the Chittagong. Thank you, Thank you Shapunda. Um, I, I, I completely understand what you have said. Definitely indigenous uh, people. Uh, yes, uh, that is another area like I have mentioned, Afsan Chaudhuri's work on the Hindus and the, uh, and the uh, Grameda Kathar and those. So people, and I said that people can have different references. I have, uh, I, when I th think about 1971, uh, these are the two others which already have been discussed by the researchers, but I think there's still a lot to do in this area, but I acknowledge and respect your perspective as well, and I, I, I completely agree with you. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm sorry to rush everyone because we have another very interesting panel coming up uh, in um, just about in 12 minutes. Uh, so our next panel is Resistance and Social Movements. But uh, before that, uh, please join me in thanking these incredible speakers and for their powerful presentations. Uh, and also we look forward to engaging uh, and reading, uh, engaging with you and reading your work. Thank you, Said, Sajjad and Laili.